You're watching The Sports Objective, the podcast for pirates. You're listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on The Sports Objective. Join Coach C, the USA Strength and Conditioning Hall of Famer, every Monday night to see in a variety of guests, including former players, former and current coaches, pastors, and others will discuss relevant issues in coaching today's athlete. The goal of equipping the athlete and those coaching them with the physical, mental, and spiritual armor necessary to live their best life. Here's Coach Connors. Welcome to Absolute Empowerment. I'm Coach Jeff Connors. This segment will feature Coach Boo Sheck Snyder, longtime Division I track coach, majoring in jumpers, vaulters, and combined events. Uh, he has trained 19 NCAA all, uh, champions. 70 All-Americans, has had multiple coaching stints at LSU, uh, also served as chair of the Coaching Education Committee for the USTFCCA. Uh, I have been very fortunate to host Boo as a clinician uh, and enjoy his hospitality on a visit to Louisiana to learn from him and also experience crawfish at its finest. Uh, Boo, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, man. I'm really happy to... Uh... Happy to be here. Well, Boo, you know, I, I was in uh, <clears throat> collegiate strength and conditioning for over three decades and uh, counting my uh, high school experience somewhere around 40 years. And uh, I will tell you that you are the most impressive coach that I've ever been around uh, with regard to speed among and also among other things that you have knowledge of. So uh, I'm very privileged to have you in the show. And uh we're going to zero in on the optimum training program for uh, skilled position uh, football players at a high level, collegiate and professional level. And, uh, you know, that that being said, let's go directly to the offseason training program for uh, DBs, receivers, quarterbacks, running backs. And I'm also going to include linebackers because uh, – that linebacker position has changed over the years where those guys have to have a lot more mobility and uh, they're more like 230, 235 as opposed to what they used to be, 240, 250. And, uh, you know, we want to optimize power and, and relevant speed specific to those positions. Uh, knowing we have somewhere between seven to nine weeks in two separate training cycles in the off season. But, uh, I want you first to uh, tell me some major considerations as to where we direct our energy as coaches. And uh, also, I'm going to add to that right now. Uh, to start with, uh, how does the body become more explosive? And what is the potential for muscle fiber to change uh, that plasticity issue relevant to the type of training that we incorporate? So, uh, I've mentioned a whole lot of things right there, and I'm going to let you go ahead with it. Well, yeah, well, I, I think any time that you start to address a problem, the first thing is what exactly are we trying to accomplish? You know, so we want to get this kid ready to play football and particularly the skills, the skills position. So uh, what do we have to do? The first thing, obviously, is they have to be ready specifically for the sport. You know, and that's an important thing. However, sometimes there are traps that you can fall into, and the traps that we often fall into, I think, are failure to just advance this person as an athlete. Sometimes we worry so much about the specifics of the sport that we fail to genuinely improve their speed and power levels over the course of the four years or whatever it is that you might have them. So raising the ceiling ultimately is a major concern. Specific fitness at that point in time is another concern. And another key factor is what are we doing in order to load tissues, meaning that's part of specific conditioning. You know, every time I see a football season begin now, I see rashes of Achilles injuries, rashes of pectoral tendon issue, issues, rashes of uh, all different types of soft tissue injuries. And um, it just seems that culturally now we always question the load, but we ought to be to some extent questioning the preparation in that regard. So that being said, all of this has to be done in regards, uh, in a way that respects 
fast twitch fibers. You know, we we do have fast twitch capabilities. All of us that are in these sports do have inherently uh, some fast twitch capability, and we have to respect that. Meaning that there are certain ways of training athletes that go about assassinating fast twitch fibers. I'm afraid, you know, I made this comment from time to time that a lot of collegiate programs now, uh, it seems like we're taking 4-3 and 4-4 guys and bringing them into the program and we're turning out 4-5 and 4-6 guys. And in many ways, they're better players, but that raw speed, why we wanted them in the first place seems to be somewhat neglected or even gets worse in certain situations. So that being said, I, I think that it's important to get them into, I know you have short windows, but I think that it's important to compartmentalize, meaning that there are periods of time when you invest in true speed and power development. Uh, there are other times when fitness and the specific forms of fitness start to become more important because it's a little bit more urgent. And I think it's when you blur this compartmentalization is when you start to see programs that are just ineffective, basically because you're trying to do all things at the same time. And I don't know that that's truly possible at a very high level. We still good? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we wait for some guidance there. Okay. Um, those are three or four powerful yeah, questions. Happened. Came all at once. If you want to discuss specifics, just lead me on. Yeah, I thought something happened to us technically. Okay. <laughs> I thought the internet might have froze there for a second. Or something. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what I want to try to do is, uh, you know, look specifically at what, at what we would do in uh, in the weekly schedule. And so, you know, we've talked about this before a little bit. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the three-day program uh, for these skilled athletes in the off-season and what you might uh, incorporate into training on those three days? And I know we've also talked about many times, you've talked to me about uh, those other two days with regard to recovery and relationship to producing moderate lactate levels. And uh, so can you get into that a little bit? Well, what I try to do is I basically break anytime I'm training any kind of athlete and, and you know, are, are setting up programs in my consulting work or whatever the case may be. I typically look at three types of days, you know, I mean, basically we have neural days where we are really focused on speed power types of issues, you know, high in neuromuscular demand. And then we have days that aren't high in neuromuscular demand. So when I look at the days of neuromuscular demand, typically they're one of two, you know, either we're trying to stimulate the nervous system in preparation for some type of really high level quality training, or we're training at a very high level. So when I sit training up over a few days, what I typically will do is I'll begin with some type of speed power type of day that's geared basically towards stimulating the nervous system for higher levels of response. It improves rate coding capabilities, recruitment capabilities short term. Then I like to come back the second day. And the second day is a genuine high intensity speed power type of session. That session typically features sprinting. It features high intensity plyometrics. And of course, there's a key weight training component in that session as well. And it's basically about achieving intensity in that particular uh on that particular day you know this type of day is the day when we genuine genuinely raise the ceiling so to speak on an athlete's athleticism it's an opportunity for us to uh also load tissues at a very high level uh if the levels of tissue load are high in that situation then it means that we're going to be more resilient to injury and such and then typically the third day is when we start to look at metabolic types of things you know in these situations in most days what i'm looking for on that third day is some type of training typically it's circuit training that's going to produce moderate uh high to moderate levels of lactate uh, and by producing this lactate, we stimulate growth hormone responses, and then the athletes actually recover faster than they would had you not done anything at all. So it's stem, it's train, and it's restoration. And the, the interesting thing, Jeff, and the thing you've kind of alluded to is that as I get deeper and deeper into my career, I'm starting to realize that the line between fitness training and restoration training is a very, very blurry line. If you have 
uh, an athlete and you put that athlete in a in an anaerobic or glycolytic training situation, what we find is the growth hormone responses as a result of that lactate. So many of the things that my athletes kind of don't like and find to be maybe the toughest are often the things that help them to feel the best. That's what endocrine science basically is telling us. So, so you know, I kind of have, as my, you know, I used to look at fitness training and restoration training as two very different things, and that just isn't the case anymore. Um, I've looked at, you know, when you look at good training programs across the world and different people and how they do them, just about every restoration program has lactate as at its foundation. Even the people I've found that claim they're doing aerobic work, which I kind of disagree with, when you start to look at it and you start to do blood draws, you start to find that, yes, there is some lactate that's being produced in those situations. So that being said, that would be the feature of that third day. You know, you have to hit moderate lactate levels. Now, when you get, when you cross over into um, extremely high levels of glycolytic fitness, uh, then things start to change a little bit. I'm talking about the really, really difficult fitness-based types of workouts. And when you cross over into those zones, then the acidity starts to become so high that we get some interference at the neuromuscular junction. And then the next thing we know, uh, the speed work we're trying to do doesn't really take root. So I, that's the reason why and the rationale for the compartmentalization that I was discussing earlier. I think that it's important to understand that because in many programs I've visited, coaches are so worried about fitness at the highest levels throughout the entire year that they kind of put a ceiling on their ability to achieve improvements in speed, achieve improvements in power output. And because of that, you know, these athletes don't really reach their potential. So that being said, that's why I try to have coaches understand that, you know, there are, it is important to invest a certain part of that nine weeks or eight weeks or whatever you have, or in some situations, possibly even all of it into genuine athleticism improvements, genuine speed improvements, power improvements, strength improvements. And keep in mind that, you know, because you're activating and, and improving the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissue, you're also producing a more fruitful ground for, for skill development as well. To this day, I'm convinced that a lot of drop passes and fumbles and turnovers and things of that nature are because of indiscriminate use of these types of training and such. And if we can do things just a little bit better and compartmentalize things just a little bit better, then that's not a big deal. You know, I, I find solace in the fact all the time that um, when you look at aerobic versus anaerobic adaptations, glycolytic adaptations, they're very different. You know, aerobic adaptations, you know, aren't really our concern, frankly, in this particular sport. But they're fairly permanent. You know, you're building mitochondria, you're building, um, uh, you're building capillaries and so forth. And it takes a long time. On the other hand, though, the glycolytic adaptations, the ones that we are uh, concerned with in this sport, um, and, and, you know, these guys have to run a lot, particularly people like DBEs and receivers and so forth. The glycolytic fitness is important, but those glycolytic adaptations are chemical. Not, not structural and chemical adaptations take place much quicker. So I don't see the need to spend long extended training phases in this. It seems like you can produce these levels of fitness fairly quickly. So that being said, that's why every time, you know, the athletes come out of season or out of spring training and whatever, I try to advise strength coaches to go into something like this, to go into something where you really try to advance these athletes athletically and then, you know, if it's important to you toward the end of those cycles, then start to introduce some fitness. And then if, you know, you can, in best case scenarios, uh, training camp is the best place to do this, not the time leading up to training camp. Right. Uh, you mentioned rate coding. Can you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Because I know that that's yeah. really important to you. Yeah, it is. And I base a lot of what I do on what I'm thinking is going on as far as rate coding is concerned. You know, when the nervous system stimulates muscle tissue, it sends an electrical impulse. It's not totally unlike the electric current that runs in the wires in your house. However, the way the human body operates, it doesn't send a steady electrical signal. It sends pulses. And when this electrical signal is sent to the muscle tissue, 
these pulses, these electrical pulses result in the muscle being stimulated, but in between the pulses, the muscle relaxes. So what we see is with really good athletes, they're capable of sending more electrical pulses in a second than a poor athlete can. So that way, if you're a great athlete and you're capable of sending hundreds of electrical pulses in a second, that means there's very little relaxation time available to the muscle during that time. If we're not capable of doing that, we have lots of relaxation time available to the muscle. So my point is, is that the muscle gives the appearance of being stronger. We get the appearance of being faster, not because the muscle has changed, but because the muscle is stimulated at a higher rate. So ultimately, that's what we're trying to train is the ability to stimulate muscle tissue at higher rates. And that type of training doesn't result from anything we do fitness wise. It only results from the genuine things we do that are fast and explosive in our training. And the interesting thing about ray coding is that if you take an athlete and you train them correctly for long periods of time over, you know, over, months and even years, we see significant improvements in rate coding capabilities. If they invest time in long, long term in significant dosages in quality training. So this is why it's so important to accumulate quality training over time and not spend your time wallowing in a big pile of so-called high level fitness training, because if this is the case, you missed tremendous opportunities and tremendous windows uh, for development with that athlete. And I, I just think that's why so often in the NCA in particular, a lot of athletes just never get to reach their physical potential. You know, if you pay close attention, you see athletes that blow up in the NFL all the time that really didn't blow up in college. You know, if they're capable of hanging on and making a team, then suddenly things change dramatically for them, often for the better. And I've just noticed this phenomenon over year over the years. And I just think this is kind of part of it, so to speak. So ultimately, that's what ray coding is. And I also uh, believe strongly that uh, if you have an athlete who's trained correctly for extended periods of time and you take a day off or two days off, the ray coding capabilities plummet. So they, they fall off. Now, this isn't a large problem because they come back very quickly, meaning that uh, once you start training again, once you resume training, maybe on a Monday after a weekend off, the rate coding capabilities by the end of Monday's session are back in place. But this is also why I think a lot of coaches will make the mistake of trying to do their true uh, high level speed work, high level power work on that first day of a cycle after maybe an off day is the nervous system just isn't stimulated at a level sufficient to do that. And that's why I kind of set up those types of models where I prefer to do like a stem type of day with some basic acceleration stuff, some light Olympics, you know, uh, basic plyometrics, things of that nature, and then come back the next day. And that's the day when we really truly load from a uh, speed development standpoint. Gotcha. So what you're saying is like a Monday might be a medium intensity day. In the speed power world, correct. Okay. All right. So, for example, maybe Monday we do short accelerations. Maybe on Monday we'll do um, med ball heaves or something like that. Doing something sharp, doing something explosive, doing something powerful that's not long in duration, so to speak. You know. Yeah. And then maybe uh, maybe you do some light Olympic lifts, something along the, that line. You know, working basic power. You know like around 60% or so for really fast bars. And then maybe you come back the next day. And then next day is when you really get after it with max velocity work. Uh, high intensity plyometrics could possibly be placed on this day. And then maybe this is the day when you get in and really get after it on the squats or you know press or whatever the case may be. And then of course the third day would be the, 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 the fitness slash restoration based kind of day. And again, that day would be the day that would be uh, begin more with a restoration theme, but you might start to slant it a little bit more toward fitness toward the very end of your eight, nine week cycle, whatever that, that may be. Yeah. And I've also heard you talk many times about, uh, you know, after you do your dynamic warm up, going straight to your sprint work first, uh, because it's the most valuable thing you can do with regard to, uh, providing tension to the muscle and connective tissue, and then having some, some other positive, uh, 
affects even your lifting program from that particular premise? Can you, can you hit on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's very important to understand that your sprint pro, your speed development program, along with your along with your plyometrics, they kind of go hand in hand. That's where you load tissues, and and that's the tension that we were you were just discussing. You know, you can take an athlete and lift them regularly and, you know, do tempo with them regularly and get them fit as hell. But if you take them and then go sprint them, they're sore. And the reason why they're sore is because you're operating in the eccentric zones. What you're doing there is you're actually producing levels of tension and applying those levels of tension to muscle tissues and connective tissues. And because they're sore, what that's telling you is that the levels of tension that you're actually achieving in your sprint and plyometric program, as far as the tissues are concerned, are much higher than they are in the weight training program. So this is why I always say two things. First of all, if you don't have a really high quality linear speed and plyometric program to go along with your weight training program, it doesn't matter how well your weight training program operates. It's not operating at peak efficiency by any means because you need that tissue load and you need that neural stimulation in order to reach it. You know, this speed work reaches corners of strength development that you can't get to in the weight room. So for years and years, you know, we've always been drilled to think that if we get strong, we'll be fast and the strength levels will improve our speed levels. But what I've learned is that it's also just the opposite, meaning that you genuinely need speed types of speed based training and power based training in order to maximize strength improvements. So, for example, many coaches in weight training regimens, traditional weight training regimens, have answers. You know, when, when a kid starts to plateau, when a kid levels off or whatever, you know, they'll go to different types of loading or whatever the case may be. In my program, when I feel that a kid in the weight room is starting to plateau or, or we're kind of stuck in a spot, I just back off do more speed work for the additional neural stimulation and the additional tissue load and then come back to it and that's what always moves things along that's why my program if you look at it is fairly devoid of really complicated loading schemes in most of the strength based lifts is i just try to use neural stimulation as the thing that gets me through the tough times and, and instead of complicating loading not, not that there's anything wrong with that but I, I just stand strongly by the statement that if you don't have a good speed development program to go with your strength development program, you don't have a good strength development program. Gotcha. Can you address, and I've heard several track coaches uh, address this over the years, indiscriminate hypertrophy? Well, I always concern myself with hypertrophy from the standpoint that ultimately we reach a, a, a point of, where body mass doesn't help us anymore. You know, if, if we look specifically at the sliding filament theory and how the muscle tissue operates, um, we, we find that force and velocity are generated independently. So if you look at inside, you know, the sarcomere, what's going on, the force of a contraction is related to the number of cross bridges that are cycling. Okay, so uh, the number of cross bridges that are capable of attaching. But velocity has nothing to do with the number of cross bridges. Velocity has to do with the rate of cross bridge cycling, which, you know, which is related to myosin and isoforms. And that's when we get into slow twitch and fast twitch and so forth. But my point being is that what this is telling us is that if we build more muscle mass, Yes, we get more cross bridges and more cross bridges attached, and there's a potential there for more strength. But because of what happens at high speeds, when it's more difficult for these cross bridges to attach at high speeds, we see inefficiency at high speeds. So what this is telling us is that hypertrophy is beneficial to some extent as far as strength development is concerned, but only with the slower forms of strength. So hypertrophy in this regard, if we understand the biochemistry, if we understand the physics of the sliding filament uh, uh, theory, what we're saying is that hypertrophy is not going to help us at all as far as speed development, power development, and acquiring additional speed. So there does seem to come a time when 
you know, muscle mass just doesn't help anymore and might actually be a bit of a hindrance, uh, no doubt, as far as speed development is concerned. You know, I've spent my whole life in a, uh, in a sport where you are limited uh, muscle size, meaning you don't have the ability to be successful and indiscriminately put muscle on people. So therefore, this is why, you know, over time I've had to adapt and all good track coaches adapt and understand that the key strength adaptations don't come from changes in the muscle. They come from the improving the way the nervous system activates the muscle. So in that being said, that's very important. And I also, just a personal observation, to this day, I will stand by the statement that the reason why their injuries are so prevalent in football, or one of the reasons why anyway, is because you have lots of 340 pound guys, lots of 340 pound guys who should be weighing 310. And you have lots of 260 pound guys that should weigh 240. You know, and in many situations, I think this mass just produces problems. Right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the lower leg with regard to hypertrophy and uh, what's the best way to train the lower leg and how much importance the lower leg has in relationship to sprint training? The, the lower leg is huge, meaning that the ability to train that muscular tendinous unit, you know, the Achilles tendon and the mus attached mu muscles is very important. But I take a, I go about a fairly unique way of training that area. Uh, I, I just firmly believe that when you look at uh, the body and you look at the sinewy areas of the body, the areas of the body that do not have significant muscle mass, um, those types of areas do not respond well to traditional concentric training. Um, and concentric training, you know, the traditional things we do in the weight room just tend to tighten that area up and it often produces more problems than it does solutions. So I'm the person that has, I'm, I'm completely devoid now in my program of doing anything in the weight room at all for the lower leg, you know, because I just think that things like calf raises and all the band exercises and things of that nature, they just tighten the area up. And then next thing you know, you got a locked up cuboid and Achilles issue going on or something like that. So what I do is I solely rely on my jump training, my plyometric training and and so forth in order to condition that particular area of the body. I find that it results in greater elasticity, you get greater pliability, you get less adhesion, and therefore as a result of that, you have less opportunity for injury. And a lot of coaches kind of freak out, you know, like, well, you have to strengthen that area of the body. Keep in mind, strength is not just lifting weights, strength is the application of tension. And the plyometric work and the jump work that you do produces higher levels of tension than the weight room did anyway. So that being said, I, I pretty much am away from that type of stuff. I know a lot of other coaches have moved away from that as well uh, with good results. The few coaches I know that I consider good coaches who are still doing some type of lower leg work are pretty much doing negatives or eccentrics and not doing concentrics in that regard. You know, uh, being around baseball was kind of an education for me, you know, for a little while in my career. You know, I saw so many of the baseball players who were, you know, doing wrist curls and reverse wrist curls and the rice bucket was in the in the uh, in the um, in the weight room and in the, the clubhouse. And, you know, everybody was trying to get the big Popeye forearms. And once again, that forearm is a body area that doesn't have a lot of connective, a lot of uh, muscle tissue. It's a sinewy area. And then the forearm gets real tight. And next thing you know, you have a UCL or an elbow injury or something along those lines. And I just type, kind of extrapolated that philosophy to the lower leg. And I just find that you get far better energy return if you kind of know what you're doing in the plyometric world, know how to, you know, work in that world and progress plyometrics correctly and achieve your tissue loads in that way. Yeah, so a couple more general questions. Uh, if I have someone coming in my program who has more fast twitch qualities uh, coming in the door, you believe that that person adapts more readily to training? 
obviously they'll adapt more readily to that type of training to the speed power type of training that you do you know so ultimately that's why i think in some ways shapes or form it's important that we adapt our training to those body types in some way shape or form now that's a tremendous challenge you know and uh in team sports because of the fact that individualization of workouts becomes extremely clumsy and cumbersome but still uh i think this is why we look at groups the way we do and we group training the way we do and we group you know athletes together in certain types of characteristics you know i've been a a, a proponent for a, a very long time of training athletes not so much by their position or their or even by their sport but more by their body type you know i i look at the um the you know the, the athlete who's got the slim build you know whether they be the defensive back or the wide receiver or whatever the case may be you know and those athletes are built to sprint you know those athletes are built to to do plyometrics but if you look at the weight room with those athletes like they're not really built for high dosages of weight training so we try to get our tissue loading goals and our neural stimulation predominantly through sprinting and jumping and of course the weight weight room there is it very important but typically it's more about quality than quantity in those situations like when i'm dealing with like skilled people and those types of body builds like a weight workout might be like three exercises but like i i, I keep the list very very short uh invest in multiple sets with the understanding that if i give these athletes who because of their physical builds and makeups do not have the capability to handle with quality extremely high levels of weight training and high dosages of weight training then if i give that athlete like three exercises like an olympic lift an upper body lift a lower body lift and i just do multiple sets of those i get far far better quality far better bar speeds or far better loads or whatever the case may be you know i i just think that when a skinny kid goes into the weight room and sees a list of 12 15 exercises on a sheet the first thing they're looking thinking as is i'm not killing myself on this first one because i got to make it down to the bottom of that page uh, you know get down to the bottom yeah. of the car and i just wanted to and always want to encourage risk taking in the weight room from the standpoint of loading whether it's loading with speed or loading with uh or loading with um uh, uh weight whatever the case may be now obviously with bigger body types and don't have the ability to handle the sprint volumes don't have the ability to handle the plyometric volumes or whatever well this is a situation where we have to do more of that loading and accomplish more of those goals in the weight room so and again as i move from sport to sport doing consulting work or whatever i find myself practically ignoring what the sport is in many situations and looking much more at the body type you know like i don't know that in football that the six foot five 250 pound defensive end who looks like a big tall sprinter needs to be trained the same way as the 510 330 nose guard uh even though they both technically are defensive linemen Well, getting back to the weekly schedule, <clears throat> so a little more specificity with regard to, uh, I, I think we talked about this before. So would you be thinking about acceleration, resisted acceleration on a Monday and then some absolute speed work on a Wednesday and then some more uh, metabolic type work like sprint float sprint on a Friday? Would, would, uh, is that kind of on the track we're on here? Yes, yeah, you're very close. You know, uh, we talked earlier, I discussed earlier three day cycle, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those days are back to back. You know, typically when I'm training athletes out of season, I really like to have like an acceleration day on a uh, on a Monday. Again, that's the day that stimulates them after that Sunday off or possibly Saturday, Sunday off. And that's the thing that really brings those rate coding capabilities back. So that sets you up for better uh, max velocity trainings, true speed development types of training later in the week. Uh, with, when I'm working with uh, high level athletes, often I'll separate those days as far as Monday and Friday. Um, one of the things that I, this, and this is me personally, I'm not saying that it fits all the time into the football model, but when I'm really concerned with 
speed development, you know, and that's my key thing. I'll typically set up a, a week like this. What I'll normally do is I will have some type of STEM workout on that Monday. And so we'll do acceleration. We'll do plyometrics at a moderate level, low to moderate level. We'll do light, fast Olympic lifts. And those things all re-stimulate that nervous system. And then I'll finish that workout with my biggest, heaviest squat workout of the week, you know, what, and, and press workout of the week. So like we might bench press, you know, killer bench, killer squat kind of day. And then the following day is normally circuit restoration slash fitness base. Normally Wednesday for me is like a basic um, like Olympic day, like basically stimulating the nervous system or re-stimulating the nervous system again, based uh, um, uh, using the Olympic lifts. Thursday is another restoration slash fitness type of day featuring circuit training. And then Friday is the day where the athlete becomes an athlete. Friday is the day when I do max velocity stuff. That's the day when we pull out the big boxes and do plyometrics at a very high level. And that's also the day when I bring in the heavy Olympic lifting day. And, and the, the rationale, the physiological rationale is this. On Monday, we produce stimulation and we maintain it throughout the week. Uh, on Monday, we did our killer squat kind of workout. So that means that the muscle spindles, a lot of the proprioceptors in the muscle tissue are very fatigued. So it takes a while for those proprioceptors to recover. Now, it's been my experience that Tuesday and Wednesday are often, if you have a squat on a Monday, are not good days for speed development. They're not ready yet proprioceptively. Thursday works pretty good. But the reason why I have traditionally done them on Friday is because I find that the proprioceptors kind of super compensate, meaning that if, you know, I squat the hell out of them on a Monday, then the proprioceptors improve and recover. And eventually we regain our high levels of coordination. But on Friday, that super compensation seems to take place. So what happens is on Friday, these athletes are actually sharper because of the squats that they did on Monday than they would have been had they not squatted in the first place. So I think, and, and this allows for truly high quality, top-notch speed development, top-notch plyometric work on that particular day. So the whole system that I use in, in off-season like that is typically geared toward um, setting up and everything to, to happen on Friday. And I like that Monday to Friday spacing. Like I said, Monday to Thursday works. Uh, and even a Monday to Wednesday spacing will work. The only difference is, is that if that's what you're doing, then you have to be careful about why you, where you place your squat work. You know, I, I, I just advise coaches all the time, keep in mind that you cannot just squat athletes indiscriminately anytime you want and expect speed to take place. You know, the squat workouts that we do, whether, and it doesn't matter if it's eccentrics or half squats or isos or whatever, none of it matters. Ultimately, long, slow times under tension produce proprioceptive fatigue. And we often assume that because the soreness is kind of getting gone, is gone, that the athletes have recovered proprioceptively, but that isn't the case. You know, I've seen athletes in track and field, like thrower types athletes, I've seen situations where they do killer squat Monday and they throw like a champion every Saturday. You know, they're, they're feeling their bodies, they're sharp, they're they're explosive and they look really good. And I've seen situations where they'll do killer squat Monday and then on Saturday they look like garbage every single week. And when I started like studying these programs, what I realized was that in some programs, these kids were doing killer squat uh, Mondays and they weren't really doing much of any strength-based lifting throughout the week. What they were doing was Olympic lifting, ballistic stuff, more speed power type of stuff throughout the week. Whereas many athletes were doing that killer squat Monday, but because there were lots of other strength-based types of lifts distributed throughout the week, what happened was the proprioceptive uh, regeneration and restoration wasn't happening. And as a result, these athletes basically plummeted into a, into a bath of poor coordination, of discoordination. So I would just caution coaches to keep this in mind that, that the proprioceptors don't necessarily recover at the same rates. And ultimately, proprioception is 
what we're after. I mean, that's where your skill comes from. So it's just, uh, that's why I've kind of evolved to a philosophy where like when I do strength based stuff like squats and presses, like I really hit it hard. And then I try not to hit it often, if that makes any sense, you know, in the model that I just talked to you about, uh, if I'm going to do other strength based lifts, I typically will do them like Friday evening after the speed development stuff is gone or whatever the case may be. It's just been my experience that most people in, in these programs where speed acquisition is poor, they typically do exercises like squats or deadlifts or whatever the case may be uh, far too often. And in many cases, too light where they're getting all the baggage and the problems, but they're not actually getting the strength out of it. And I do want to say before I hand back off to you, Jeff, is that um, um, Olympic lifts don't do this. Like there's no baggage that comes out of the Olympic lifts. And that's why I kind of like to build my program more around those. I'll Olympic lift at any time because they don't produce any of that type of baggage. Yeah. Well, I love to hear that. So, <laughs> so I concur in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I, you know, in the track world, you see kids doing Olympic lifts the morning of a big competition in the evening, you know, for the stimulation. So right. you know, that's that's why I love Olympic lifts. There's outside of the immediate fatigue, you know, that might come from a heavy workout. There's like no baggage, no negatives that come from them at all. Right. Well, of course, you know, we hear quite a bit. Whoever we're listening to to uh, as far as speaking goes about force application force application and that started with me uh, you know back in like 1980 something with kevin mcnair was the first person that i heard really address that you know uh he was kind of the first speed guy for football i think he ran a track with charlie francis uh somewhere but um uh but um what you know what i'd like to kind of get into a little bit is the posterior chain uh, because that's what everybody talks about so much. So during the course of the week, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, what we're doing on Monday. So, and even from a, a unilateral standpoint, so looking at posterior chain exercise, unilateral work, what else would you incorporate? And where do you put it? it? Just about every philosophy, training philosophy you can find, I employ at some point in time in my training. Um, when I look at posterior chain work, um, I know that a lot of people like to supplement posterior chain because of deficiencies there. But it's been my experience that if you are um, working full ranges of motion in high dosages, that very seldom is this a problem. You know, um, I like you, I'm old enough to have seen the whole circle. I remember back in the old days, everybody squatted deep, right? And then yeah. people got scared that it was bad for your knees, right? So nobody squatted deep anymore. And then all of a sudden we found all these people had strong quads and weak hamstrings and posterior chain issues. And a lot of injuries were coming because of skewed quad hamstring ratios and so forth. And then after all of that was over, they found out that the reason why we had posterior chain deficiencies was because we didn't squat deep. So it all came yeah. back, back to, all came yeah. back. To it. So, so I really don't supplement posterior chain work, to be honest with you, uh, for any reason. Uh, I, but, but when I, like I said, but my, my default squat is like a deep sub parallel squat. I'm not afraid to go down, I, I, you know, even with the skinny people, you know, get, get the damn broomstick and go down and get your ass, you know, it, you know, b below parallel there. That's, that's me. Now, I'm not saying that I never do shorter range of motion stuff because sometimes for specific positions, um, I mean, body positions, not football positions, but for specific positions or, or for power output levels, you might have to decrease the range of motion. But I try to go big range of motion anytime that I'm doing strength based lifts for that particular reason. When you go big range of motion, every muscle has to contribute at its intended time in that firing sequence. Uh, that isn't the case when you break break things down. So I try not to isolate. Now I get asked the question all the time, well, what about hamstrings and hamstring wrists? I'm going to go back to what I said, you know, like the, you know, the, the loading that you get from speed uh, training is a much greater level of tissue load than what you would receive from anything you do in the weight room. So I don't do any Nordics. I don't do any RDLs or anything that tends to really isolate hamstring or posterior chain because all it does is fatigue the hamstring without 
without doing anything truly beneficial. I'm not saying you're not getting tissue adaptations there, but what I am saying is that I've seen athletes who do Nordics regularly and go out and when they sprint, they tear hamstrings on a regular basis because coaches fail to understand that the levels of tension in the sprint are higher than they are in the Nordics or whatever you're using. So I haven't had a hamstring pull in my personal group, knock on wood, for 35 years. And I tell coaches all the time, it's for two reasons. It's because I know how to teach the mechanics and, you know, and, and, and I get flexibility. I make sure mobility is, is present at all times. I never compromise mobility. But more importantly, it's because I sprint the athletes at all times throughout the entire year. I don't have phases of the year where we fail to sprint. So the hamstring is constantly conditioned for sprinting because of the fact that we do it all the time. If it's a risky time of year, we're sprinting short. If it's a training time of year, we might be sprinting slightly longer, but we're always, always sprinting. Now, as far as unilateral work is concerned, it's a very important piece of the puzzle because, you know, there are big unilateral components in lots of sports. You know, I spend my lifetime in, a, I spent most of my lifetime in a sport that is practically strictly unilateral, but I still, um, Endure, I'm a, and to some extent, I might endure criticism, but let me explain why. When it comes to loading, uh, I still am a bilateral person. And the reason why is because when you want to load speed, power, or strength at a high level, you got to keep things simple. You know, um, ultimately, everything I do in the speed power world, you can count it, fall into one of two boxes. It's either a primal movement or it's a, a bilateral movement. And what I mean by primal movements, I mean sprinting and jumping. You know, running ain't that complicated. You know, in the form we cut a chicken's head off, it would still run around the yard. It's not that, it's not that fancy, you know? So, yeah. and be, because, but because sprinting is organized subcortically, it's a complicated movement pattern, but it's organized subcortically. So what I'm saying is it doesn't take a lot of brain power to sprint. You can sprint at high intensities without lots of motor control involvement. The same is true for plyometrics and such. But when we get to the weight room, um, you, you got to be simple. And, you know, I understand simple isn't sexy and simple doesn't draw clicks and hits and stuff. But ultimately, the power output levels are what's important. You know, like I've had coaches who've come, you know, I've, I, a couple of years ago, I coached a couple of uh, long jump girls and they did real well. They were like second and fourth in world championships and people come and they watch them train and I got them in the weight room and we got a light bar on their backs and we're doing like super explosive uh double leg jumps you know squat jumps uh with those ladies and people are saying well long jump is a single leg event you know therefore you should be doing single leg jumps with these ladies that's more specific and I would argue that if I went single leg with them, now they have to worry about control. Now they have to worry about balance. So what was a very explosive exercise just isn't as explosive anymore. Also, as you know, you know, if you really want to get after it from a loading standpoint, weight wise, you know, you tend to go bilateral. So my key days, my key loading days are still bilateral days. But that being said, there is a unilateral need. So I do probably 50-50 as far as bilateral to unilateral work. I do the unilateral work for specificity. But when I'm truly trying to load, whether it either be with speed or, or, strength or weight, I, I'm typically going bilateral in those situations. Yeah, and also what comes to mind there are vertical bounds of what some people call pogos, you know, going a, mm -hmm. a single leg. And um, it, do you feel like you kind of major in that as opposed to calf raises with regard to the lower leg? Yeah, that's a big part of it. And, and the vertical bounds are, are wonderful. You know, I kind of borrowed them from Dan Path many, many years ago, and I've kind of taken them and I use them for some other applications. In fact, they've become my cornerstone exercise for like ACL rehab and lower body rehabs and such because you don't really have much, uh, uh, you don't have any shifting at the knee. Uh, the quad is in position to take the hit, you know, the knees protected and so forth. So they're great exercises. And the other thing is that, you know, what I found with humans is that we really have a horizontal bias in our movements and just about every athlete that I, that you'll ever work with, 
um, needs to work harder on their vertical pushing capabilities than their horizontal pushing capabilities. We seem to be a little inherently better at it. I guess we kind of have the same hip as a horse or a dog, but we walk around on two legs and maybe the anatomy has something to do with that. But I just find that uh, most athletes are deficient in, in vertical firing and the, those types of exercises are good ways to supplement in that area. Uh, would your advice to, uh, be to apply, let's say, uh, vertical plyos, maybe two to one to horizontal, three to one? You know, what? Uh, what's your idea? Yeah, there? I do. I made that statement in, in, in the past and I kind of stand by it. I'm not saying that you have to count every single contact and make sure you're exactly at two to one. But roughly speaking, you got to make a significantly greater effort toward the vertical side than the horizontal side has been my experience. Just just to get better movement quality, better acceleration, better uh, sprint mechanics, better change of direction. Everything just gets better when you kind of get the vertical horizontal plyo ratio correct has been my observation. What are your thoughts and rules for depth jumps? When it comes to the depth, I, I love depth jumps, first of all, because there comes a time when you have to challenge intensity and some people live in fear of depth jumps. I don't, you know, I, I, use certain other forms of plyometrics like simple horizontal bounds and the vertical bounds we just discussed and in-place jumping to prepare athletes. And then I get them into a fairly robust depth jumping type of program. Um, you know, the, the basic premise of a depth jump is if I take an athlete and I put them up on an elevated surface, then gravity has more time to act upon them as they fall. And therefore, you get a higher level of impact. And the nice thing about depth jumps is that the height of the box it determines exactly the level of impact. So therefore you have control of that variable. So once an athlete is prepared in my program, I put them into a depth jumping regimen. Now, before uh, you get any wild ideas, my depth jumping workouts are extremely detailed as far as the individualization is concerned. You know, my basic philosophy is this, you know, if you have a, let's say you're working with a young man and the young man has a 30 inch vertical. Well, if you put that kid on a 12 inch box or a 24 inch box and they fall off and bounce or do whatever, that's really not that big a deal. That's not a great, really challenging level of loading for the simple reason that, you know, they could create an environment more intense than that just in any environment, any motor environment. But if that kid has a 30 inch vertical and I put them on a box that's say 36 inches high, when that kid hits the ground, they're going to experience a level of loading that they cannot achieve any other way without the presence of that box. So that's why I use individualization formulas based upon vertical jumps uh, right. not, and real vertical jumps, not, not fantasy vertical jumps either, but real vertical jumps. So if you're an athlete in my program and I kind of feel like it's time you're prepared to do depth jumping, I'll typically bring a box out that's about the height of your vertical jump. I'll bring another one out that's about six inches lower than your vertical jump. And we'll do some work off of the lower box for stimulating purposes and whatever. And then we'll start to do some work off of the higher box, you know, and it's not a lot. The, the work off of the, the work in the whole session might be 30 contacts. The work in the how the high box might be 10 or 12 contacts, but ultimately um, that's how I normally start them off you know, using a box that's right at their vertical jump capability as the ultimate box, the higher box in the, in the workout. And then once they are proficient, then you earn a little bit more box, you know, kind of three inches at a time or something like that. Well, I get into this topic with just about everybody I talk to who's a coach, uh, uh, the data collection process now and uh, uh, readiness, force plates, uh, you know, VBT training. You know, I, I'm really interested to think to, to hear what you think about VBT. Uh, and uh, because there's so much of this going on right now. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I, I came up like you did in an era where there was no technology. And now we have so much of it. And in some ways, I think that our coaching generation had an advantage, meaning that you had to figure out how to do things and you knew exactly what you wanted to measure. Now, um, with all due respect, you know, you have a, a, a person, a commercial interest who's telling you what's important. 
you know, and telling you what you should be measuring. And that bugs me just a little bit. So, you know, I, I always try to help make coaches understand that technology needs to work for you. You don't need to work for the technology. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of coaches mistake like data collection for work ethic and confuse the two and spend vast amounts of time collecting data that they really don't understand and probably aren't ever going to do anything with, to be honest with you. So I would challenge every coach who's listening to like figure out what it is you really need to measure and then figure out a way to measure it. And if that feature isn't on that piece of technology you own, then find a way to do it. And if that piece of technology you own has many other features that you don't feel are important, then just doesn't mean you have to do those things, you know? So, so that being said, and, and you can still train athletes successfully without technology. You know, I've got a testing routine that I've been doing for years and years and years, and I just have stuck with it. And, you know, it's interesting when I bring technology into the program to look for validation or confirmation or whatever the case may be, but I can't say it's changed what I do dramatically in any way, shape or form. So that being said, there's so much stuff out there you know, now, as far as velocity based training is concerned, um, I think we've always done velocity based training. I mean, I, you know, go back 40 years ago, there are days when you wanted the bar to be moving really fast and yeah. you cared about how fast the bar moved, you know. Yeah. Like, so that was velocity based training, even though we didn't have the technology and whatever. So, you know, but now, you know, what what I guess people have done, you know, and and like Brian Mann has done some fantastic work with this is identifying certain zones on the, on the force velocity curve. And he's correlated it to certain speeds of movement or whatever. And that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. As long as, as long as you're its master and it's not your master in that regard, you know, so that being said, so, you know, velocity based training, if you want to kick it up a notch as far as your accuracy and you don't trust your eye for bar speeds or whatever, wonderful go for it the one thing that does confuse me though is like if it's a super heavy squat day then why the hell do you care how far how fast the bar is moving you know right. like if it's just a heavy day and loading is the purpose then why do we care how many meters per second you know on that particular day you know other than that you know i i don't have any issue at all and i don't have any issue with any of it but like i said we we got to be the masters of the technology we can't let it run our our programs, so to, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Well, it might be because a lot of people have abandoned the super heavy day. So uh, <laughs> it could be, you know, but I still like it. I, you know, I, you know, I don't do it at all times of the year. I'm very dis indiscriminate about right. it. It's like once a week during specific prep period, but um, I feel confident that um, in it, I, I have no I'm not I'm not afraid of it because I feel like I do a good job of teaching the mechanics and the techniques. Of right. the lift. And I also feel that you get some endocrine responses out of them that uh, you may not get otherwise. I, I, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, you quit squatting. Aren't you afraid to lose strength No, Because there's lots of ways to build strength. But if that's the case, why do you squat? And that's my answer right. to them typically is I feel like I can get some of the proprioceptive super compensation ideas going that I discussed earlier. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, the squats, the king of the exercises because of the, it moves the needle on endocrine responses more than anything else you do. So I guess that would be my answer. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm just going to hit one more thing, let you go. Uh, we've talked about this a few times and I, I think there's some parallels here uh, with football players and sprinters is that when you get into the end season, you want to come off of heavy squats, go to ballistics, uh, uh, talk about the preservation of proprioception and uh, elasticity and those types of things. Can you hit on that one time? Yeah, um, I'm a strong believer that with your small people, your skinny people, skill, you know, that type of that, um, you know, the proprioception is precious. And I so what I typically do is I just discontinue like squat work, deadlift work, even bench press work and things like that in season. And I go to a pretty robust ballistic program. We will do just about every type in the weight room uh, of loaded jump. You can imagine lunge jumps, split jumps, deep squat jumps, shallow squat jumps, all of those different types of exercises on a rotational basis with a lot of variety and such. And um, keeping in mind also, by the way, that our Olympic lifting program does continue. It's only the heavy, slow stuff that we'll typically discontinue. I like that because I feel that the athletes 
not only maintain strength, but the tissue loads are very high. So in some cases, they actually continue to get stronger. Uh, I don't have to worry about not only the stiffness and soreness, but more importantly, the, the small elasticity losses and the small proprioceptive losses that come from that type of work as well. So I just find that we come up with, we see better mobility, better elasticity, better resiliency to injury as a result of that. You know, I, I know in football that that, you know, is sometimes a cultural thing. And uh, when I'm dealing with big people and muscle mass is an issue, I don't follow that philosophy. I prefer to microdose, you know, really high intense work. But with the smaller people, I prefer to discontinue it. You know, in the track world, um, all the good ones I've had, I typically am cutting squats out for them around Christmas time or so. Like that's when they'll do their last heavy workout. We had a girl on our program who, um, I'm not going to say her name, but everybody knows who she is. Uh, she set a collegiate record in the 100 meters a few years ago. Now she's an outstanding uh, international level performer. Uh, her last squat workout, she, she set the collegiate record. Her last squat workout was in December. So, and she set the collegiate record in June. So don't tell me she wasn't strong. Now, on the other hand, eight days before that, she PR'd on the power cleans you know, on a single yeah. in, in power clean. So, so it's not like we're not lifting heavy, but I just prefer not right. to do that. I'm just convinced that a lot of uh, proprioceptive issues and elasticity issues are the reason for fumbles and drop passes yeah. and things of that nature. And I think it puts you at injury risk as well. You know, like if you're, and I'm just throwing teams out there. I'm not saying, I'm not espousing philosophies, but I'm just saying if you're like the NCAA champion football, like Georgia, and you're playing a team that's obviously you're outclassing, there's always this philosophy that, well, we can squat a lot this week because we're going to beat this team anyway. But if you're not at your proprioceptive best, you know, you can blow an ACL against the bad team too. So, so in short, uh, you know, I, I just am really careful about putting athletes yeah. out in competitive situations, not at their proprioceptive best. Yeah, the uh, yeah, I mean, I lo I'd love to get into that polarization uh, concept in season. We'll save that for part two. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm glad uh, there's going to be a part two. It's always good talking to you, Jeff. We haven't seen each other in a while. It's been too long. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have the the greatest respect for you, sir. And, uh, Hey, tell me a little bit about uh, your family, about the chickens, uh, your brother, <laughs> uh, the dogs. Uh, I, you know, I, I know your mom and dad were struggling a little bit, your neighbors and, uh, you know, what, how's things going? Uh, I, I, it was kind of a rough time. My dad eventually finally passed away and that was actually a blessing. Oh, and, sorry uh, to hear that. My mom is, you know, kind of struggling with some dementia now, but she's, um, yeah. but she's, you know, she's stable and with everything. And, I had to, she's in a place now and uh, I'm, it's close by. I get to go see a visitor. I go twice a day. And uh, all, on that front, things have gotten better. You know, God's blessed us in that regard. It's a, it's a race that we all have to run. Sometimes the end of that race is not necessarily pretty. Whoever said the golden years are golden probably was foolish, but in any case, uh, life is good for me. So I appreciate your concerns and, and, uh, and thank you very much for that. Yes, sir. And I was very impressed with that house you built with your own two hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of interest. You know, I, we kind of grew up on, you know, around farming and all that kind of stuff. And we yeah. had, I was fortunate that my dad taught me to do a lot of different things. And to this day, you know, I have chickens and ducks and fruit trees and rabbits and all that kind of stuff. And that's how me and the wife, we spend our time kind of piddling around with that type of stuff. So we have a good life out here in the country. We enjoy it. And uh, with the consulting work, it's great because I can go for three, four days and then get back in time to feed the chickens. So <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's been great speaking with you again, and I'll be looking forward to our next meeting. Uh, I was uh, considering coming to the national conference, but I think it's the same weekend. I got to go to a wedding, but uh, we're going to hook up again at some point. Yeah, we need to. It's been too long. Uh, you listeners, me and this guy have gotten into trouble together on several occasions, and I've never, <laughs> I've never regretted any of it. <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot, Boo. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off now. Uh, this is Jeff Connors uh, signing off for Absolute Empowerment. God bless, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs>